Imagine for a moment what it meant to question the foundations of physics in the late 18th century, when to doubt Newton was to doubt nature itself. And yet, one man stepped forward armed with nothing but reason and a willingness to see what others refused to look at. This man dared to challenge Isaac Newton, and he won. He measured the eye, the voice, the tides, even the language of forgotten empires. This is the story of Thomas Young, the last man who knew everything. Milverton, Somerset. In this quiet village, a child was born who would one day rewrite the story of light itself. His name was Thomas Young. He was the eldest of ten, raised in a Quaker family that valued simplicity, honesty, and above all, the pursuit of truth. His parents, Thomas and Sarah Young, believed that the mind was a divine instrument meant to be sharpened by study and discipline. At two, he could read. At six, Latin. At eight, Greek. By his teens, he'd already taught himself Hebrew, Chaldean, and Arabic because he simply wanted to know how words carried meaning. For most children, curiosity fades as answers arrive. For Thomas Young, every answer led to another question. At 14, he left home to apprentice under a London physician. While his peers were still in schoolyards, Young was dissecting eyes, grinding lenses, and sketching the mechanics of sight. He wanted to understand how the eye bends light, how the brain interprets focus, and why we see color the way we do. At Emmanuel College, Cambridge, he studied everything, medicine, optics, mechanics, ancient languages. By 21, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society, the youngest in living memory. His professors found him brilliant but unsettling. They said he never specialized, never chose a field. But that was the point. Thomas Young didn't want to narrow his curiosity. He wanted to map the entire landscape of knowledge. And in 1796, at Göttingen University in Germany, he completed his medical degree, Doctor of Medicine. But his experiments were already reaching beyond the body towards something stranger, something the greatest scientist of all time had declared impossible. Before he ever changed physics, Young filled notebook after notebook, studying how the lens of the eye changes shape, how muscles contract, how sound travels, how colors blend. He believed all of nature, from vision to vibration, could be understood through waves. He began to wonder, what if light itself behaves not as particles, as Newton insisted, but as waves, ripples too fine for the eye to see? He built crude experiments in his rooms at Welbeck Street, splitting beams of light, watching them recombine. On paper, he drew the first sketches of interference, dark and bright bands that made no sense under Newton's laws. To Young, this wasn't rebellion, it was beauty. He joined the Royal Institution, where the greatest minds of his time debated the very fabric of reality. They saw a man whose mind seemed too broad for one discipline, a polymath out of step with his age. Soon he would do something unthinkable, challenge the legacy of Newton himself. And in doing so, he would reveal the hidden rhythm that connects every corner of the universe. It was 1801. For over a century, Newton's theory of light reigned unchallenged. Light, everyone believed, was made of particles, tiny, perfect corpuscles. To doubt Newton was to doubt science itself. But Thomas Young saw something the great man had missed. If light were made of particles, it would pass through one slit or the other, forming two bright spots on the screen. Simple, predictable, but that's not what he saw. 
Instead of two spots, there were many. A pattern of fringes. Bright, dark, bright again. Light was interfering with itself. Where the waves met in phase, they reinforced each other. Bright bands. Where they met out of phase, they cancelled. Darkness. This was interference. Proof that light moves as a wave. In one simple, elegant experiment, using nothing more than a candle, a slit and a screen, Thomas Young revealed a hidden truth. Light wasn't a stream of bullets. It was a symphony. But this revelation came at a price. The Royal Society was unconvinced. Newton's shadow was long. Many dismissed Young as naive, or worse, arrogant. The very simplicity of his experiment made it easy to mock. He published his results anyway, in calm mathematical prose. He introduced a word that would outlive him. Interference. In an age of giants, he became an outcast for questioning one. Decades later, Fresnel would prove the wave theory mathematically. Maxwell would show that light was an electromagnetic wave. And Einstein would reconcile both, birthing quantum physics. Today, the double-slit experiment is not just a demonstration. It's a doorway into the deepest mysteries of quantum mechanics. In 1801, Thomas Young didn't just prove that light was a wave. He proved that courage, to question even the greatest, is what drives science forward. Young's heresy became the heartbeat of modern physics. By his mid-30s, Thomas Young had turned from prisms and interference fringes to something far more complex, the human body. He wanted to know how we see, why the lens focuses for near and distant vision, what changes when the eye strains to read or gaze at stars. Young explained that the eye's lens wasn't rigid, it flexed. The ciliary muscles changed its curvature, bending light just enough to focus on the retina. The act of seeing became measurable, a question of geometry and elasticity. And when he encountered blurred lines that no lens could fix, he identified a new disorder, astigmatism, describing it in rigorous mathematical form, decades before optometrists had tools to measure it. But his curiosity didn't stop at the eye. He measured the pulse of blood like a piston, muscles as springs, tendons as levers. To Young, the body was an engine built of living physics. He even turned to the ear, exploring how the eardrum resonated like a stretched membrane. He described the principles of resonance long before biophysicists existed. He saw physiology as applied physics, flesh obeying the same laws as light and steel. Back when Newton divided light into seven colors, few asked how the eye saw them, Young did. He proposed that inside the retina were three types of nerve fibers, each sensitive to a different wavelength, red, green, and blue. He showed that any color could be formed by blending three, the trinity of vision. This became the trichromatic theory of color vision. Every phone screen, every television pixel, every color photograph, all echo Young's insight. Your screen glows in red, green, and blue because Thomas Young saw color that way first. For Young, beauty was not abstract. It was measurable, describable. Even color was a form of mathematics. By the 1810s, his curiosity had turned from light to language. The Rosetta Stone had just been unearthed, a mystery linking three scripts, one still unreadable, he realized that hieroglyphs weren't just pictures. Some were phonetic symbols, representing sounds, not ideas. In one royal cartouche, he spotted a pattern. A circle for the sun, a lion for L, a reed for I. The name was unmistakable, Ptolemy. Young's analysis cracked the phonetic code, laying the foundation that Champollion would later complete. Together, they bridged centuries of silence. He bridged dead languages and living science, a doctor decoding the speech of pharaohs, a physicist translating the universe itself. To Thomas Young, knowledge had no borders. 
Whether it was light, life, or language, it was all part of the same grand conversation. He wasn't chasing answers in different fields. He was mapping one universe, seen through a thousand lenses. The elasticity of a substance may be estimated by the ratio of its stress to its strain. While others saw only solid wood or forged iron, Thomas Young saw mathematics hidden within them. He wanted to know, when a material bends, how much force does it take to make it yield? He called it the modulus of elasticity, the constant that defines how stiff or flexible any material is. Today, we call it Young's modulus. He gave engineers a number to trust, a way to measure the unseen strength of the world's materials. Every skyscraper, every bridge, every aircraft wing owes a silent debt to that equation. But his reach went far beyond the laboratory. As secretary to the Board of Longitude, Young brought precision to navigation and measurement itself. He refined the British standard for the meter, improved predictions of tides, and designed tables that guided sailors across oceans. When engineers needed a rule, when sailors needed a reckoning, they turned to Young. He helped define the physical world, its stresses and strains, its distances and tides, turning nature's chaos into numbers. For Thomas Young, Measurement wasn't about control. It was about understanding. The language of the universe written in proportion and precision. By the late 1820s, his body began to fail him. Asthma weakened his lungs, yet his mind refused to rest. Even as illness crept in, he kept writing. Articles on bridges, on tides, on color, on the mechanics of the human voice. His final years were spent distilling everything he knew as if trying to leave behind a complete map of human knowledge. On May 10th, 1829, in his London home, Thomas Young's remarkable mind fell silent. He was 55. He was the most accomplished man of his age and the most modest. Long after his death, Young's fingerprints began to surface everywhere. His wave theory became the foundation of quantum physics. His modulus, the backbone of modern engineering, his color theory, the blueprint for every glowing screen. Even his study of hieroglyphs shaped the science of language. In his time, it was still possible for one person to know nearly everything, to see connections others could not. When Thomas Young died, that era ended. He measured the universe, not to master it, but to understand how beautifully it all connects.